AI, just like anything else, if you delegate a responsibility, you always have that risk in terms of can the delegate properly perform the duties and obligations that you're responsible for. And in terms of performance management, you can feed it data. I think you get a, a picture, certainly, but it's not the whole picture. Introducing Checkwriters, a video podcast for people who want to help their employees, colleagues, and organizations flourish and succeed. I'm your host, Dakota Heber, Chief Marketing Officer at Checkwriters. Along with my co-host, HR Manager, Felicia Corbeil, we'll hear from business leaders and pros who share captivating stories from their respective industries. Join us as we uncover their strategies and get unique inspiration for building great processes and experiences at your own organization. Check out and subscribe to Checkwriters on Apple, YouTube, or wherever you listen and watch your favorite shows. Thanks for watching. We have Megan Butts joining us today. Megan is the Checkwriters General Counsel for HR Compliance, so we like to check in with her pretty regularly because Megan keeps a weather eye on all employment law mm -hmm. and compliance news, and um, she's a great resource in the in the quest to keep Checkwriters clients informed of any changes on that front. Front. So uh, thanks for joining us, Megan. We're looking forward to getting a, a relatively brief um, update on all compliance issues, but we know that you know, sometimes lawyers can be a little long winded, but we mm -hmm. prepared you for that, right? Yes, exactly. <laughs> I, have, I have a strict time schedule. I, I promise to loosely adhere to. <laughs> <laughs> Great. You just don't want anybody to miss anything, right? Correct. Yeah. And, and like you said, it'll be a very high level view just to give, you know, employers are probably seeing these headlines in the news anyway, just to give them um, kind of the critical points and certainly give them on the path to conduct their own due diligence and inquiry to make sure that, you know, everybody's keeping up to date with their responsibilities. So Megan, one of the more uh, significant federal updates, um, recent one, is mm -hmm. the Secure 2.0. Is that mm -hmm. what it is? Secure 2.0 Act. So can you give us a little background on what that is? Because I, I know there could be some confusion because there was a Secure Act and now Secure 2.0 is the next iteration. Right. That's the second iteration. And um, Secure 2.0 expands upon um, legislative efforts to basically expand you know, retirement opportunities for uh, greater classes of employees. Uh, and as we mentioned in the article, I believe there's, there's a dearth, almost 30% of employees um, that say that they have no type of retirement vehicle or retirement savings. So this was certainly, you know, an act of Congress trying to expand um, eligibility and benefits uh, for, you know, a broader um, uh, population of the working class. Um, so Secure 2.0, it was enacted in 22. Some provisions were immediately effective and others are going to be kind of phased in over uh, the next couple of years, including in uh, 2024. And in our compliance article, we've highlighted some of those things, the more common uh, provisions that may be applicable to, um, you know, majority of employers or significant um, sets of employers to consider uh, for compliance um, obligations, um, either effective in 24 or something that's happening for planned years right after December 31, 2024 to kind of get ready for 2025 if there are obligations for employers in that respect. Got it. Um, and there are some key provisions that you've mm -hmm. picked out because um, it's a pretty big, big law, lots of, lots of Usually content expansive, in it. But you, yes. Yeah, but you mm -hmm. picked out um, a few that you think are particularly relevant for um, payroll and HR and business owners to to pay attention to. So, one of the first one of the first things we we were talking about before is the expanded eligibility for long term part time workers. Is that right? long term Correct. part time workers? Yep. So, can you tell us a little bit about that? Um, so, under the um, previous iteration of the Secure Act, it it provided that you know long term part time workers are and those are going to be that have worked at least five hundred hours. Uh, between 500 and under 1,000 hours um, for three consecutive years would become eligible for their employer's um, retirement plan. That's under the SECURE Act. So um, SECURE 2.0 actually reduces that burden to two years so that long-term part-time workers uh, are eligible to participate in their more employer-provided uh, retirement plan after two years. Um, and that's going to be effective for plan years after December 31, 2024. So it's something that for employers to consider this year uh, in terms of that reduced two-year threshold for those long-term part-time workers to get ready for um, those planned years after uh, the end of this year. Um, but it, we want to be mindful, and we actually the IRS just issued um, some um, provisions and some guidance for employers to be mindful of. There may be long-term part-time workers that have met that three-year requirement under the SECURE Act now that it's 2024. Mm -hmm. um, so the employers should be you know, auditing their census and seeing if they have any of those workers eligible under the first iteration that may um, become eligible to participate in their retirement plan and make sure that they're covering those employees and doing the proper protocols and, and making sure they're uh, giving the um, deferral paperwork for them to contribute um, and all those things. So um, it's interesting 
because it is, you know, going to be hugely expansive for certain industries. And you have certain typical industries when you think of long-term part-time workers, and that's going to be in kind of like the hospitality industry, or if you have, you know, quick service restaurants, fast foods, you have usually have huge subsets of uh, part-time workers. Um, and those um, employees will now be eligible under the new parameters uh, to participate in a, a retirement plan that uh, that's employer provided, which is which is good news for employees. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, the second provision of the Secure 2.0 Act that you wanted to make mention of is is called de, de minimis incentives, mm -hmm. which is um, Latin for pertaining to minimal things. Yes. Yeah. Now, um, you know that because you're a lawyer. Oh well, yeah. <laughs> there's a lot. There's a lot of Latin. There is there phrases is, yes. in, in law, aren't there? there? Um. So the so my understanding is that these de, de minimis incentives already existed for employer sponsored plans. Correct. But mm -hmm. how are how are these incentives impacted by the Secure 2.0 Act? So they uh, they became effective in 22, I believe. But there's been recent guidance by the IRS IRS Notice 2024-2, I believe. Um, they issued some more guidelines for. Um, employers to follow in terms of how to govern if should they offer um, de minimis incentives. And basically, when you think of it, you think of kind of like a sign up bonus, you know. Um, and this aspect, it's meant for, to in, in a sign up the, bonus, um, signing up for the retirement for the plan? retirement okay. plan for participation in the retirement plan. Okay. So these are for the employees that kind of you know either um, they didn't sign up and eligible, or they and either because they forgot about it, it wasn't it wasn't uh, especially uh, on front of mind or. Uh, maybe they considered it, but you thought, well, maybe, you know, the deferrals from my paycheck may be too great for me to participate. And it's something that I want to kind of keep, you know, I need the weekly as much, you know, weekly income as I can. Um, so it's for those employees that are not currently enrolled in a plan. And it's something that the employer can offer. And the threshold, you know, typically is uh, no greater than $250 uh, that the employer can offer. Typically, um, most employers, I think, would offer by way of some kind of gift card is, is kind of the usual. Or it could be, a, you know, a cash uh, a cash offering in order to um, induce employees that have not enrolled and, and don't have a, a deferral choice in, plain, in place um, to participate in the employee-sponsored uh, retirement plan. So that's something that employers can do. Is that a, is that a common feature of employer-sponsored plans, that they offer something like that? Um, I, think, I think it is. You have to be mindful that, you know, when you're offering a, an incentive of you, um, it may be considered um, as wages to the employee, you mm -hmm. know, so even gift cards because it's in the nature of cash or currency. Um, that's something that, you know, typically the employee may have to, um, you know, it may be subject to income tax because it is in the nature of, of wages because it's a cash cash provision. So that's something that some employees can, um, can think about. But um, it is, I think, and you see it in other aspects in terms of, you know, sign-up bonuses for certain aspects of health plans. You'll see that to kind of incentivize employees um, so I do think it, it is something that you, that you do see. Great. Thank you. Um, and the, the third thing to talk about the provision about matching contributions on student loan payments, mm. that always sounds really good to people. Tell us more about it. Yes. And, and that is, um, as of last report, I, I still have to, I have to check, but we, there has not been, um, more additional IRS guidance on exactly how all that will function. Uh, but in so essence, we're still up. So with student loan payments in the Secure 2.0 Act, mm -hmm. we're we're awaiting IRS guidance. We're well, a little bit up in the air on what what exactly that's going to look well, like. Well, it's effective now, and uh -huh. there is some parameters that employers can follow. It's just down to you know more specific instruction in certain circumstances or exactly how the plan is going to function. Okay. So it became at the uh, effective at the end of last year uh, in 23, and basically, if you're going to make a um a deferral election in terms of which is a salary deferral from your paycheck, and you contribute, and there's a matching component by your employer. Um, for uh, 401k, 403b, 457b, and simple IRAs, um, rather than having that salary deferral, you can actually have the, the, the value or the money that you pay on your monthly student loan increment um, used as your salary deferral, in essence, and then have the employer match to your student loan payment. So you're not decreasing any money from your paycheck like you would in a normal salary deferral arrangement and having those funds set aside for retirement. You're certifying to your employer, I have a monthly a student loan payment, say, of, you know, $400. And um, the salary deferral election, say, based on the percentage of whatever my salary would be uh, on a monthly increment would be, you know, $200, which is, which is high, but just for simple figures. Uh, rather than saying, take that $200 from my paycheck and have the employer match that based upon the plan provisions, you're going to give me credit for that salary deferral because I'm making a student loan payment, a qualified student loan payment, and you're going to match it anyway, even though there's technically nothing to match because it's not a deferral amount. So you're having the ability to build up 
your retirement um, account by the employer contributions through the employer match, but you're also able to have those funds available to make your student loan payments. And that's been kind of a big, um, I guess, obstacle for um, new grads and even existing grads is that they would want to be more aggressive and want to contribute to retirement plans, but they do have a heavy lift monthly with their student loans. So they can't allocate those funds normally to say to stash those away for retirement because there's a present need to meet their monthly loan payments. Mm -hmm. um, so that's something that's been attractive, especially, you know, industries that attract a lot of new grads or, you know, like tech companies is huge. Um, that could be an incentive, you know, to to kind of draw in um, new talent for new grads to say that we understand that you that you have financial constraints with student loan payments um, and you can basically certify and paying this each month and the employer will match the amount of your of your qualified student loan payment. Certainly there's vesting and contribution limits that are typical to ordinary salary deferrals. Uh, so it'd be up to the, the maximum salary deferral limit. So if you had an outrageous student loan amount that exceeds that, which, you know, some students do, uh, you wouldn't get 100% credit for that, you know, in terms of the match to the exact amount that you pay for your student loan payment. It would be up to the salary deferral limit. But it does give some breathing room um, for, um, you know, post-grad, you know, new, new grad employees that want to, you know, start retirement planning, but also have a present obligation to meet their student loans. If there were someone to elect the student, this, the student loan payments under the, um, under the Secure 2.0 Act, are they, they're basically choosing the benefit of employer match 401k. Mm -hmm. They're using that for student loan payments. They're not doing both. They're not, they're, or, or are they able to say, I want to do this for my retirement, but also I want to have another one for student loan payments? How does that work? You could. So you could do the, the traditional salary deferral. Um, you could do a hybrid. You could do what is traditionally done. You have a percentage of your salary that's deferred. That percentage, maybe 3%, is matched by your employer and deposited into a retirement account that's administered by the plan administrator. Um, or you could say, I'm going to take that whole amount of whatever that 3% matches. Maybe that match equals, you know, in terms of dollars, $500. If, you know, the 3% match from the employer, I have to pay $500 a month to my student loan. So rather than having any portion of my salary deferred, I get my whole salary, but I get the benefit of my employer contributing to my retirement plan and I can make my student loan payment. Or I could split the baby. I could say, well, I have a $500 student loan payment. I'm going to allocate 250 for the qualified student loan payment matching. And then I'm also going to take 250 of my salary deferral each week from my paycheck and contribute that with the matching contribution from my employer. So you could do one or the either, or you could do a combination of both. Yeah. One more question just about the, you mentioned that it has to be qualified loan payments. Mm -hmm. So does that mean that it can only be those federal loans that people received, or can it be private loans that they received through different like banking or financial industries? Um, to my knowledge, it would be applicable to all qualified student loans that are made for eligible um, expenses. So I think that the it doesn't from my initial reading, and I have to double check. I don't I don't discern a distinction between private and public, uh, private and public loans, private or federal loans. But there are going to be limitations in the amount of the payment that is covered depending on what the loan was taken out for. So when they say qualified student loan has to be for qualified uh, student expenses, typically that's going to be tuition and fees, you know, applicable to the attendance of the student at university or college or whatever it is. So obviously, you know, anyone that's gone to college or has a child in college knows that tuition and fees is a very, very, very small subset of what it, it costs for college attendance, especially, especially these days. So it would be those, um, the portion of the loan or the payment that is attributable to paying towards a qualified student loan expense. Um, so if you know, and, and that's something that, you know, would be um, would be good to have additional guidance because, you know, especially now if you have, um, you know, student loans that are taken out for discretionary expenses, either for travel or for sometimes for, you know, non-traditional housing, or if you had something, you know, with that, that student loan, uh, I'm not exactly sure the impact of how you would discern or have to separate out the amount of that payment or not. And I think that's, that's something to look out for. So Felicia, you're the HR manager at CheckWriters. Is this um, the student loan repayments? Is this a, co a common question you get from candidates a, as a as a potential benefit? I wouldn't say it's a very common question that I get, but every now and again, people ask me more so about like tuition reimbursement, their ability to take courses, their ability to take college courses, if that's something that we would pay them for. But I don't know if I've actually had anybody ask me about this specific payback. Um, to the student loans or this specific act. I don't think anybody has asked me about that 
yet. What do you think about employers offering it though? Should are there are there different? Are there? I'm still not totally clear on the cost considerations. It sounds, Megan, like when you were talking about it, the the employer it might may not necessarily matter. Like they're going to be doing the employer match for 401k anyway, and this is kind of just a, the same thing by another name. Yeah, in large in large respect, yes, it, it may open up the the class of employees who participate a little wider because you may have those that maybe decided not to initially participate or they had a more modest salary deferral in terms of the match. Maybe they didn't do the maximum match by their employer. Maybe they did one or 2%. Uh, so I guess an effect could be that you may have greater greater participation because you're, um, you're kind of relaxing the participation requirements a little bit. But um, to your point, Dakota, exactly, the, the employ- it's based on the employer match. So the, em- the employer is going to be matching the funds for the employee, whether it's a salary deferral or whether it's they want to use the money to make their student loan payment. So the match is there at any event. So um, it is something that is really within the employee's core to decide how they want to manage uh, manage their um, their financial future. If they if they have a present need versus a future need, or if they want to have kind of half and half and see how to do it that way. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I was thinking that because um, I mean, you can imagine uh, on its surface, some employers might look at that and think oh, I've got to like pay my employee student loans now. Like it's just another added expense. But mm-hmm. as you outlined, it's, re- it's really not, not necessarily that. No, it's yeah. just the employer is matching what mm-hmm. the student is obligated to pay for their loan. So the, there's no obligation on the employer side to make any payment towards the student loans. That's 100% within the obligation of the, of the student employee. Um, it would just be the, the match amount, which normally would um, match with the salary deferral is now just being matched in terms of amount against the qualified student loan payment. Got it. And finally, the last piece you wanted to cover, Megan. So penalty-free withdrawals for certain emergencies. What's the deal with that provision? How does that work? Penalty-free withdrawals is, a, is a, an important point, and it is something that um, I think the when the legislature looked at it, they a lot of another reason for non-participation particip- non for employees is, well, you know, I live paycheck to paycheck, so I need to have a rainy day fund or an emergency fund, so I really can't contribute to both because I either have to allocate this money you know, for a future expense, I know I'm going to have, but in the event of a medical or a personal, you know, personal emergency, I'm not going to have anything available. Um, and it's um, for uh, early distributions, there's typically for any tax advantage um, retirement accounts, it typically is a 10% penalty for an early distribution because it's supposed to obviously go in and grow. You're not supposed to touch it until age of eligibility, which is typically 59 and a half or, or according to the dictates of the plan. Um, so if you do take money out early, you get hit with a 10% penalty, and then that's you know um, something that is supposed to deter um, accessing it basically as a glorified savings account. Um, so what the uh, Secure 2.0 Act has done is that has made a provision that in limited circumstances for um, an, an emergency personal expense defined under the Act that you could take up to $1,000 or the um, the maximum, um, the, the vested benefit at that time if it's less than $1,000. You can take it out um, without that 10% penalty um, as long as you have a, um, an eligible um, emergency personal event, you know, that you require or need the funds for. Um, and that is, you know, something that's defined um, under the Act as any distribution from an applicable retirement plan to an individual for purposes of meeting unforeseeable or immediate financial needs relating to necessary personal or family emergency expenses, which is extraordinarily broad. So it gives, you know, a lot of leeway in terms of employees, you know, having to access that um, and having that available. So they would be able to do that um, and it would um, waive uh, the 10 percent um, early distribution penalty. And it has to be a, it's a one time withdrawal, which is which is, you know, key. It, it's not something that they can use on a revolving method. It's a one time revol- withdrawal um, at a time. And there's a three year payback period if an employee, you know, can't repay the funds, which happens if you're it makes sense if you have to go to your go to your retirement plan for some liquidity. In all likelihood, you're not going to be able to pay it back in one fell swoop. You may need some time. Um, so it does provide that there is the ability to pay back um, the funds over three calendar years, um, but you will be prohibited from taking another distribution until those funds are replaced um, or the funds, uh, the aggregate of the deferrals and the employee uh, contributions. Um, meet that level of the of the distribution that you took. So they want to make sure that the account basically is made whole before you try and access it again. But that does give a little bit um, more breathing room for employees that may feel the crunch of a, of a personal expense or a medical expense, um, and they can access that without having um, the 10% penalty applied. I'm really surprised they didn't give more guidance on the emergency, what, ca- what counts as an emergency. 
Yeah, I think it's, um, and that is um, in terms of, you know, the the employer is is allowed, I believe, to just rely on the um, certification from the participants that they are, you know, um, experiencing this circumstance. Um, I don't know if there would be something more in terms of, you know, documentation or, or what would we, we required to affirm that. But I think it's it's supposed to be more generous and more broad as possible so that employees um, do take advantage of it. Um, and it is it does have some constraints on it so that it, it limits the potential for abuse in terms of draining your account habitually so that you're not earning the retirement that which is kind of the whole the whole purpose of contributing to the plan. Um, but to your point, yeah, it, it is it is certainly broad, and I think that employees, um, as they use it, you know, certainly more guidance may develop on what is um, acceptable versus not. All right, thank you, Megan. So again, that was a that was a quick overview of the Secure 2.0 Act, um, a recent recent federal legislation that should concern um, all HR folks and business owners also um, relating to employee retirement, and other items, as Megan outlined. Let's move on to another federal development, Megan, uh, the independent contractor rule. It seems like there's always a rule about independent contractors. Oh, yes, they're like yes. <laughs> They're under the spotlight all the time. Always. But, <laughs> but it looks like um, after a public comment period, uh, that, that this new rule from the Biden administration for, relating to independent contractors took effect in uh, March 2024. Mm-hmm. So Let's brief, briefly run through the your key takeaways on the Biden DOL's new independent contractor rule. Um, well, the the crux of it is uh, the independent the existing rule that was put in place in twenty one under Trump. Um, there has been long standing kind of judicial precedent in terms of a, a number of factors that are considered uh, when you are determining either employment and uh, a worker classified as an employee or a worker classified as an independent contractor, someone in business for themselves. Uh, so under the Trump administration in twenty one. Uh, there's a, a six-factor criteria that's typically used, and the Trump administration elevated or made core factors two of those factors for employers to rely upon when they're kind of doing the analysis. And those two factors are, what's the degree of the nature and control that the worker has over the work, and it's the opportunity for profit and loss. So rather than you know what's done in what is under the current rule now, which is a totality of the circumstance standard, they consider all six factors and there's not supposed to be any dispositive weight assigned to any of those those factors. It's a holistic approach, considering everything together. Um, the Trump administration said, you know, kind of for ease and for clarity, and, and I think realizing um, the um, the um, practical considerations when you're trying to make this decision, how how much control and direction does this person have over their own work, and what's their ability for profit and loss? Is it dependent on the employer or the are the are the or is it something that they basically dictate either by the quality or quantity of their work? And that's something that was supposed to make it easier for employers to use in determining whether um, the individual worker that they had hired was um, an independent contractor or could be classified as an employee under the FLSA. So the, um, the new rule that has been put in for Biden, which effectively revokes the 2021 rule under Trump, it returns to what has been what has been examined in case law as a totality of the circumstances test, and it applies equally to all six factors. So basically, Megan, what, what it sounds like the the Biden rule would encom- would restrict the number of people who could be classified as independent contractors, right? Because they would need to meet many more qu- criteria. Whereas the Trump rule could, it's. You could. There's more people that could be considered independent contractors under that. Is that right? Basically, the what the a lot of industry opinion is that where the current standard now is much is not is less intuitive, is more complex because it's a holistic approach. You have to consider all six factors. It makes it more difficult in terms of saying yes or no because there is such uh, individualization on each circumstance type. Whereas under the Trump rule, he looked at two key things, which most people look at in terms of. Do you control the work and how much how much could you make from this to say, are mm-hmm. you in business for yourself? Are you an employee of, of the of the hiring entity? Um, so a lot of industry um, associations um, and uh, especially, you know, guilds in terms of like journalists, a lot of gig workers um, have great concern to say that, well, if it's making more difficult for these companies to hire independent contractors because the standard is that much more difficult to apply and understand and predict then that's going to have a chilling effect on on companies. And they're going to say, well, at risk of misclassification under the new rule, I'm either going to limit my use of independent contractors 
or I'm going to limit, you know, how I use them. I'm going to limit maybe the time or the funds allocated to them because the new test, even though it reflects what the Biden administration said has always been historically done from a from a legal perspective in terms of the analysis, um, there are a lot of gig workers and ICs now that are saying, well, it's not going to be worth it for employers or companies to take the risk on us because if they can't understand the standard or the standard is more difficult to apply or it may be even leaning more so to an employee classification that it's going to be a chilling effect for independent contractors and they're going to lose business, which is a significant concern. Oh, I see. That makes sense. Okay. So, yeah. so the, the main criticism of this is that it, it, could, it could potentially harm independent contractors. It's harming the workers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's the concern, for, for, especially for the lawsuits that have been filed so far. Um, have been from, you know, uh, gig workers and, and different associations that are saying that either the rule is in violation of the delegation of powers in terms of how they've, how they've um, organized the rule and, and things, or, you know, it's been arbitrarily or capriciously applied. Um, and, you know, a lot of gig workers are very concerned that um, they, they are gig workers for a reason. It's, typically, it's going to be a profession and a circumstance and an arrangement that they've chosen. You know, they like the flexibility. They, they like the control. They um, you know, they, they like the way that it's set up as ICs and they're, uh, another concern is that they may be forced into, um, an employment relationship as an employee, which is something that they don't want. And I think the Biden administration is, um, their, their bent or their re or rationale for returning to a rule that, that, um, is, you know, I, I guess could be deemed as more pro-employee because their concern as always is always going to be on, you know, employee rights and that with employees that you may have the expert, the um, uh, possibility for exploitation and abuse and abuse by companies that have uh, I was greater power say, that they, would they, say they'd be thinking the that maybe that we're protecting the employee from being right. taken advantage of by the employer and, being treated as an IC where they should be given the full rights and benefits of exactly. an employee. And yeah. that's been the the impetus for the Biden administration or the rationale for returning to a holistic approach to make sure that all all facets are considered um, so that, you know, um, employers are not using the classification of independent contractor to skirt their obligations in terms of their payroll obligations for Got taxes, mm -hmm. as well as the rights that are that are um, uh, provided to employees under the FLSA for, for wage and hour consideration. So, which is certainly, you know, it, it's noble and, and it's, a, it's, it's well intended, but I think the greatest concern that practically it, it may, uh, especially for ICs and gig workers, is that it, it may have a chilling effect on their ability to be hired by companies because the rule... Um, is, is, is more difficult and is more complex. And as you say, uh, as is so often the case with these folks, they, it, it's, it's almost like, well, I enjoy the freedom. I enjoy working mm -hmm. for myself. I enjoy working for, for maybe multiple companies at once and sort, mm -hmm. sort of this role. So um, how do employers kind of navigate this? Because it, it's gone back and forth several times now. Mm -hmm. um, and now uh, we're coming up on an election year. It seems like the, these, these rules and and um, the way the way employers can expect to treat, as we're talking right now, independent contractors, but there's several other things that flip flop back and forth too. Um, how do they kind of prepare for this new rule that could flip back again? Um, it, it's interesting, and that's the thing is, I think it's you know kind of stay on your he your heels because you know there have been a number of legal challenges um, lodged in different states. Um, there also was a um, uh, the challenge that was done in 2021 when uh, the Biden administration withdrew the Trump role, um, that was uh, the subject of litigation. That's basically been put on pause while federal rulemaking, you know, continued, i.e. this current iteration. So there have been actually, um, you know, the parties involved in the, the initial lawsuit, I believe in the Fifth Circuit, um, to revive that litigation for the for the initial withdrawal of the 2020 rule and try and have a, a way about to have the rule examined in that respect. So I would say for employers, certainly keep an eye on, on the legal challenges that have been filed and most likely will continue to be filed. Um, and, you know, to consult counsel who can, who can explain in terms of your business model and what your functions are and your personnel um, based on the new definitions um, that, you know, how would this be? And, you know, given all of the six factors applied to your specific business uh, is the best way to consult legal counsel in that respect to have a, a better understanding of, well, what is my my the heightened obligation that I could have in this respect, you know, and definitely review all of your existing uh, independent contractor agreements and any questions that you have, certainly consult consult with counsel. Mm -hmm. 
So that wraps up the independent contractor rule. Megan, how about, so we were talking two, two federal items here, the Secure 2.0 Act, the independent contractor rule. Now let's move down to the um, big changes to employment laws at the state level. So one that, one that we've talked about a little bit, because um, we've got you know, a bunch of clients in, in the state of Illinois. Um, what, what's going on in Illinois? Uh, so Illinois, is, as um, um, several states are doing now, and you, you saw you know, years ago there was kind of the wave of earned sick time for states and um, uh, uh, mandate. Uh, Illinois has expanded that and that it's, it's earned paid leave. So it's not just specific to sick. It could be holiday. It could be personal. Uh, and they've uh, implemented a law effective January 1, 2024, uh, that would require um, majority of employers in Illinois um, to provide up to 40 hours of paid leave per year for any reason. And it's going to be um, one hour um, for um, every 40 hours worked. And that would entitle the, the employee does not have to provide a reason for it, just like with a typical PTO paid time off. They don't have to provide any explanation for it as long as they follow uh, the, the policy in terms of notice and requesting and all of those things. That would give um, the uh, employees in Illinois the ability, for, and that's the, the expansive nature of the act for all workers, and that's what the, the act is intended. Um, there are some exemptions, you know, under the under the law, you know, for employers that are not subject to the law, but uh, it is a very very um, significant uh, portion of the state that would be eligible um, for paid leave for any reason, not just for sick time. So, it sounds like a pretty expansive law. Is Illinois mm-hmm. the um, the leader in this? They're the first to do something this encompassing, or are there other states who have who have something similar? No, I believe Vermont has a has a paid leave for for any reason that mm-hmm. was enacted in the, um, recently. Um, any other states, I would I would have to check. I'm sure course, that other sure. states have it, but you typically see it in sick time because it, it kind of the the sick time is a very the sick common time one. is a very common, yep. and it's I think that's viewed more as a necessity, mm-hmm. you know, for employers, and that's why they're it's it's been able to pass at the state level such broadly because everybody gets sick. Um, so that's something, but this is something that I think is more reflective of, um, you know, people need time off for reasons other than illness, you know, for family circumstances or for, you know, relaxation and, you know, vacation. And, yeah. um, so you see states kind of recognizing that. So, um, moving on from our federal and state updates, just some kind of quick things that, uh, caught Dakota and I's eye when we were preparing. Um, and so without providing legal advice or guidance, we have some questions for you. Dakota, do you want to start? Uh, sure, yeah. So these are just like quick takes, Megan, quick takes okay. on, on hot topics. So let's talk a little bit about potential risks when using artificial intelligence, AI, for performance management. Oh, performance management. Now, you do typically see in the context of hiring um, for AI, but AI, just like anything else, if you, if you um, delegate a responsibility, you always have that risk in terms of, um, you know, can the dele- delegee or delegate properly perform the duties and obligations that you're responsible for? And in terms of performance management, you can look at, you can feed it data. Like for instance, you can look at, you know, simplified data of attendance policies to say, feed this, feed this, attend- this employee's attendance record for the past three years into this AI model and project what is the use? Is there typical, is there indications of use and abuse around holidays? Is there typical indications of, you know, um, attendance or absence without notice? And, and I think, there is a utility in that, but I think you also have to be be mindful in per- terms of, you know, outside of the kind of, you know, um, I'll say the neutral data, like the attendance, the attendance reasons. If you're looking at the nitty gritty of an employee's performance, I think it's like anything else in life with people is much more nuanced. And if you feed into, um, you know, maybe an employee's performance in terms of just projects allocated, projects completed, timetables, um, customer response times, um, you know, feedback with things. I think you get a you get a, a picture certainly, but it's not the whole picture. And I think like anything else, um, employers should be very wary in terms of relying on, just like in the hiring context, relying on AI to make the decision for you. If anything, it should be a co-pilot. It should give you information that you should consider and maybe analyze it so that it's a way that that it's more digestible or it's something that maybe something that you could notice with the human eye just from looking at a stack of reports. They analyze it and they can give you certain trends and indications of things. Absolutely, there's utility. But I think like anything else, um, you have to be very, very mindful of not letting the the, um, algorithm or the technology dictate what your action will be relative to that employee's performance, either with an upwards or downwards. And you have to really think about you're the one observing them. You're the one that has the expectations that you set. So that's something that should only supplement and never replace 
uh, and even only supplement partially, I think is something to consider. Yeah, that's such sound advice, Megan. And I think um, the headlines with AI are always mm -hmm. the the over the theme is always they're repla it's replacing mm -hmm. human behavior, human jobs, human decision making. Um, but as you say, uh, the the folly is is thinking that thinking that right. You need to. It, I like your analogy of of a co pilot. Maybe even less than a co. Maybe maybe mm -hmm. like a, a junior. Um, co-pilot in training right. should be what it, what it really is is mm -hmm. considered because ultimately um the human behind the technology as always is going to be responsible for the for those decisions and any ramifications nobody's going to come back on the ai they're going to come back and say why did you let ai take control of this process you really ought ought not to um so that's 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 uh sound advice yeah um megan so next next question <laughs> um you talked a little bit uh, when we were talking about Illinois and the paid leave. Um, you talked a little bit about that at the state level. We know that there are plenty of states now throughout the country that have paid family medical leave programs. Mm -hmm. And it just seems like sometimes people are taking leaves through these programs for various things that maybe don't always feel like that's what they should be utilizing. Do you think that there is a possibility or, you know, I guess from a higher higher level thinking perspective on it that some of these programs are being overused or not utilized enough. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on that? Um, I think you have, I think both extremes are present. And I think with um, even in, in, in an employer sponsored leave program, you have the potential for, for abuse, you know, by, by employees or um, you have the potential for, um, you know, maybe have a, have a, a chilling effect by the employer so that employees may may not know about it or may be fearful to exercise whatever the, the paid leave may be, uh, depending on how the, the company is run. So I think you certainly have both present. Um, I don't know if that's, if it's any more frequent, you know, with state paid leave programs. Um, the utility of that is it is a, a more formalized, documented progress, which should be, um, you know, more uniformly implemented. So I think that's good for employers and employees. So it takes a lot of the guesswork and some of the discretion out of whether they think a circumstance is qualifying or not, or whether they think the, the amount of leave are appropriate is, are appropriate is not. And that is, you know, because that's set by, by statute. So I think that's helpful for both parties, that the expectation is set on both sides. Um, but I think employees um, and employers both have to um, recognize that um, just because paid leave is provided for either, you know, at a, at a state level, um, or by an employer that there are requirements for both parties to abide by. And that's, that's the, kind of the whole crux of it is that um, you have to abide by the uh, state leave requirements in terms of, you know, documentation, qualifying circumstance to make sure that the eligibility is met and you've met the earnings threshold if a state has one so that you qualify for benefits. Um, and that's obligations on the employee and on the employer. Certainly, if it's been properly noticed and requested, it's something that you're obligated to provide and you provide it timely. And you work with your employees in making sure that you're doing your part uh, and providing notice of their rights to to access it. And that's I think that's a question for some, you know, make sure that you have your poster up. If you have an individual notice that's required to employees, make sure you're providing that. If you have an HR person in-house, make sure that they're knowledgeable um, about the law and its application and what paperwork is required, what timetables are required, you know, for employees and make sure that they're going about it the right way. If any aspect of the law that is dictated by employer policy make sure that there's a clear policy for use and that employees are abiding by the policy requirements as well. So um, I think anything, there's the, the potential for abuse. And I think employees need to be, uh, it, it is, um, it's a benefit that shouldn't be abused because you want to make sure that you don't see a free for all, you know, if, the, if there is rapid abuse, you know, of some of these programs, you don't certainly don't want to see, you know, um, employers, you know, less receptive to them in states that don't have them. They say, well, you know, um, so uh, that would just be, so I, I think it, I think you see both, both sides of it, but um, state run programs certainly try to limit that because they do have a, a, a formal, you know, a formal documentation process for it. Last but not least, it's an election year. So what advice do you have for employees and employers who maybe feel like they need to talk politics at work um, or maybe they're restricted in talking politics? Like, how does that dynamic work? What advice do you have for those people in those situations where they either feel like they can't talk politics or maybe they talk politics a little too much? Mm -hmm. um, I think you have to find, you know, a healthy balance because the, the reality is that, you know, coworkers 
you know, they work and they, they have a working relationship, but they also have a social relationship, even if it's just while they're at work and there's no socialization or maybe friendship or camaraderie outside the office that your, your day will dictate, you know, or, or, or necessarily have facets of um, what's in the news, what's in the media, what's going on. That's just a natural inclination for, for people to discuss about. So I think, you know, having um, the, a healthy amount of discussion so long as that there's, there's boundaries for it and there is not um, either a chilling effect on one side or a, an open forum in terms of, you know, a, a diatribe by employees where other employees are maybe made to feel uncomfortable about certain things and you're getting distracted from what you're doing, which is work. Um, I think you also have to be mindful of that. You know, there are companies that put out the presidential information, uh, the presidential candidate information, where they stand on issues relative to their company structure and focus and say, this candidate supports A, B, and C. This is how it affects our company. This candidate supports X, Y, and Z. This is how it could affect our company. You know, when we decide this way or when we, we talk with clients who have questions about it and say, this candidate is more leaning this way, this could be an option. This candidate leans this way, this could be an option. You know, and keep, make sure that I think clients where it could be affected in terms of policy, especially, you know, for financial clients, that's going to be a big thing. I think they appreciate that your staff is kind of informed about the presidential race and to see on, on, on bigger issues specific to company matters, not individual matters or, you know, individual politics or social politics, but specific to company matters, I think it can be helpful, you know, as long as it's, you know, um, done correctly. But um, you also have to be mindful um, about, you know, with the, um, where the discussion of politics, you know, could potentially affect um, maybe a legally protected issue or a legally protected right, um, you know, where, you know, and you see that in the ever-expanding kind of jurisdiction of the NLRB, um, under the National Labor Relations Act, which does apply to private companies in, in smaller respect. Obviously, it's, it's more, uh, majority meant for um, laborized forces, but with private companies, non, non-union, um, you know, there are applications that protect an employee's right to speech, you know, free speech, uh, organizing speech, if it affects their working conditions. So I think you just have to be mindful of that. In what context is it being done so that there isn't that in, invertent infringement of the NLRA, which you've seen kind of in other circumstances, like with the Home Depot case, with um, with the BLM um, indication on the employees on the employees' apron, um, and that was you know recently found that that was protected speech on the NLRA because you know you could make an association between BLM and workers' rights. Um, so I think employers maybe not in years past, but certainly now want to be mindful that you know when they hear about you know, political speech for their employees, if it's something that could affect, you know, like a, um, you know, um, an employee's right, you know, under the LA, for instance, just to be um, very mindful in terms of whether they are promoting or discouraging that to make sure that they're within, within the um, legal confines. So, um, so it's an interesting topic. I, uh, so we'll see. Thanks, Megan. Like, like so many things that we talked about, another, another bit of a minefield. For employers to navigate. It is. <laughs> it is. Certainly. Yeah. Yep. Um, well, Megan, General Counsel for HR Compliance at Track Riders, thanks so much for uh, coming on. We're going to make this a, a regular thing because um, there's always something going on in this world, always always something new, and we like to keep our, our clients informed of any of any developments on the employment, employment law or, or payroll HR compliance front. So uh, thanks a lot for coming on, Megan. We appreciate it. All right. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you. Thanks for listening to this episode of Check Writers. Be sure to follow us on Apple, YouTube, or wherever you view your favorite podcasts. Stay tuned for future episodes where we'll continue to uncover the secrets behind successful organizations.